right, so quick introduction. Quick introduction. My name is Eric. I'm the founder and president here at Perry, and we're a managed services provider and a managed security services provider here in Austin and Dallas, Texas. Um, we've been in business for about 14 years. Uh, we too are we're also um, involved with SCORE. We have been since the beginning of, of, the, of the organization, and um, it's been extremely massive help to, to myself, my, my company, my team, and uh, we couldn't be where we're at right now if it wasn't for SCORE. So, so, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone's time and attention in today's webinar. We're going to be going over something that's extremely important to your business, which is going to be email security. Um, email security specifically for small businesses and um, what you can do to better protect your, your organization from these threats that are coming in internally and externally. So we'll go ahead and get started. So email security, um, you know, what is email security? It's it's really the practice of, uh, of protecting email accounts and communications from, from unauthorized access. You know, anybody that's accessing any communications from within the company that's sending out information, you know, internally and externally, you want to make sure that you're doing your very best to protect that information as much as possible. It's also a way for, for bad actors and, you know, people that are, are looking to exploit these, these, these uh, security gaps in your, in your organization and leveraging email security to do so. Email security protects accounts against hackers and decreases the risk of compromise. So a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is obviously gonna be focused on email security, but you'll learn that email, um, not having email security is one of the biggest threats that you can have towards your company or have in your company. And obviously businesses will lose time and energy, time, money and energy when their email security fails. So if you don't have good email security in place, that's going to be the biggest loss there. And what that means to you, I'm sure you can calculate that based off of you know, how important your time, money, and energy are to you and your company. So why, why it's important, right? Um, I mean, obviously, it's going to protect your brand and reputation. You don't want somebody compromising your email and, and thus putting your brand and reputation um, um, uh, at risk. Uh, it allows security teams to stay on top of sophisticated threats. So if there is a threat that is ongoing, um, if there's an email thread that's that's kind of happening and and something that's happening real time, it's going to keep the security teams, um, you know, obviously staying on top of it. It enables secure communication with colleagues, customers, and partners. So if you, you know, implement good and proper email security and you've implemented those best practices, It'll actually not just protect the, the communication internally when I say colleagues, but also externally with customers and partners as well. So um, the risk of receiving a, a bad email or sending out a bad email or um, not doing your best to protect that information within that email is, is what we're going to be going over today. And lastly, it reduces the risk of malware reaching your inbox. So malware is malicious software. A lot of that comes in through email. You click a link. Uh, obviously there, there's going to be some kind of uh, virus or something that's introduced to your system and possibly your network that's going to have just a, um, a slew of problems you know to come with it so um, what we want to do is we want to be able to protect against those kinds of those kinds of threats um, from your company and coming in through email so let's talk about a few common email threats uh, the first is social engineering um, this is and we'll talk about what social engineering is here in a, in a couple of slides, ransomware, phishing, and malicious spam. So in general, you know, email is the largest attack surface for hackers. And it is, and from my experience, uh, you know, we're a managed services company. So we manage, monitor, maintain computer systems, servers, networks, cloud infrastructure, softwares, and everything in between for small businesses. And we see that a lot of the times, if you don't have good email security in place, that's where the biggest threats come through. It, it's the, it, it literally is the largest attack surface for hackers and um, the biggest gap for small businesses. So it's something you wanna pay very close attention to. Um, there was a report, uh, Verizon reported that 85% of all data breaches involved human error. And I personally think that's a lot larger um, and you can kind of see what's been happening with not just small businesses, but you know, you've seen governmental agencies, uh, companies, both public and private, um, you've seen companies of all sizes. I believe there was even a, an attack that happened to a social engineering re recently with Twitter. So a lot of these companies are doing their, are trying to do their best to protect against these kinds of things. But if they're even, if they're getting hit, imagine how much easier it is to hit a small business. So 
you got to take the right steps and put the right things in place in order to better protect those kinds of things. And we're going to talk about that. And, and, and uh, lastly, they're often difficult to detect without proper employee cybersecurity awareness training. So not only are we going to talk about best practices and things that you can implement today, but we're also going to go over different solutions that you can, you can either purchase or, or implement within your company to better protect your systems now. But lastly, we're going to go over cybersecurity awareness training, which is going to be educating your end users on, on what they can be doing and looking out for in order for them to be really that frontline defense between a threat coming from outside of the organization and into the organization through an email. All right, so social engineering, uh, social engineering. Common email threat is, you know, methods used by cybersecurity, I'm sorry, cyber criminals to lure unsuspecting users into releasing private information. And what social engineering really is, is it's basically somebody, I mean, you, you've heard about people pretending to be employees of the company, um, people pretending to be vendors of the organization, you're reaching out through an email, um, saying that they are a vendor and need some, you know, information or they're trying to get paid. Um, so they ask for like banking and routing information. Um, you know, that's a method for these hackers to get into your company and exploit these, these gaps in security. So that's something you want to be mindful of. Manipulation tactics that, that brick users into giving away sensitive information. I've actually heard about this happening, not just through email, but people now are doing this through social channels. Um, uh, bad actors are doing this through social channels, but they're also doing this by um, through phone, by reaching out and, and asking information about the company, you'll be surprised how much information employees are giving out when they shouldn't be giving it out. You know, talking about internal systems and softwares that they use and security that they have and, you know, um, things like that that could be avoided just by simply educating your users and um, just, again, keeping them, keeping them in the forefront of their minds that they are, you know, putting that guard up whenever they're dealing with somebody that, that may or may not be a threat to the organization. With um, ransomware, so ma ransomware is malware that withholds data and um, it threatens to publish information or blocks access to a system until a ransom is paid. You hear a lot about ransomware in the news. You, you've heard about this for, you know, I guess years, if not decades now, and, and you're seeing it more and more often. And sometimes you're not even hearing about it when, when companies are getting exploited and, or, or, or agencies are getting exploited and they're not saying that they were you know, experiencing ransomware, but they actually were. Um, because it, it, is, it can be embarrassing. It, 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 it's, uh, it's something that you know, a company gets held hostage. Nobody wants to talk about the things that they didn't put in place in order for them to better protect their company. But what's happening is these businesses, especially small businesses, again, both in public and private sector, are experiencing ransomware where their, their systems, their data, their information is being held ransom. And the only way they're able to get out of it is if either they, A, pay the ransom or B, they start clean. And it's really hard for them to recover from something like that. And I've seen it and it's unfortunate, but most businesses just end up leaning on their cybersecurity uh, insurance or they end up just paying the ransom out of pocket. So. Um, what we're going to talk about is things that you can put in place today to help protect against that. Um, and it often uses encryption to deny a user or organization access to files on a computer. So what happens through ransomware is the, um, the software will be introduced to the network. It'll act as a virus or it'll act as a, you know, a malicious software. And what it does is it locks the data down and it has an encryption key, that, that security key. And in order for you to get access to unlock your data, you have to thus pay the ransom. So that's why they call it ransomware. Co other common email threats are going to be phishing. So targeted emails that lure users into giving up sensitive information, such as login and financial information. Um, phishing emails come in all shapes and sizes, uh, different types out there. Some of the ones that I've personally seen have been things like, you know, um, people pretending to be vendors and asking for banking and routing information. That's a common one. Um, emails coming in with hyperlinks that are not links to, they look like they're coming from someone within the company. So it'll be like coming from the CEO or COO and saying, you know, to, to another employee saying, I need you to take care of this, this, and this, and click this link to continue. And people will click the link thinking it's coming from their boss, but it's not. I've, um, I've seen them come in for, you know, just a simple, 
you know, basic phishing link where people will accidentally click the link because they think it's like a, a bill they have to pay or action they have to take on it or something or other. And, and a lot of the times these things can just be avoided by A, just having a proper spam filter in, in place and, and B, by having a cybersecurity awareness training in place as well for your end users. So they, they kind of know, well, if it goes through the filter, we're still able to protect against it now and in the future moving forward. Uh, and, and phishing is the most common cyber attack businesses face. I can tell you personally that the companies, every company that works with us, they, they, they're going to have a spam filter. They should, or they're soon, they're soon enough going to. Um, but every company that we've worked with or that we plan to work with, you know, if they don't have a spam filter, this is the very first thing that we, we typically recommend to them. And we'll say, hey, you know what? If you don't want to rely on the spam filter that comes with just Microsoft Office or G Suite, you want to get something on top of that, an extra layer of security, something that's a little bit more robust, that's going to give you these options to be able to, to really hone in and, and target these specific you know, uh, phishing emails that are coming in that potentially can cause harm to you or your company. Um, number four is malicious spam. So unwanted messages that spread malware to infected computer systems. Uh, with a proper spam filter, obviously, this is something that's going to take care of something like that. So it'll it'll scan through incoming emails and it'll it'll make sure that those emails, one, are uh, a part of either your allow or block list. And, and two, it'll it'll say, hey, if these are emails that are coming from trusted sources, we'll go ahead and allow them in. And if not, we'll go ahead and quarantine those emails so that you can look through those emails later on to see if it's something you want to either release or deny. So just an extra layer of protection that that. that person will protect against those kinds of things. And then uh, lastly, opening or clicking on these messages will install malware on your device. So in the event that these messages come through and make it into your inbox, by clicking a link, you'll actually be introducing malware not only to your system, but potentially any systems that your system is connected to. So if that's you know, uh, SharePoint or a server or other computers or depending on what that computer does and the access security and permissions of that, com that computer and user have, the impact can be pretty large. So some of the challenges that you're gonna face um, are gonna be weak endpoints, work from home and lack of awareness. In general, um, an increase in work from home policies and business technology adoption, this is gonna be one of the biggest challenges. As we saw from the pandemic, a lot of companies went to work from home and I, I personally enjoy it. I like work from home. My team also does remote work. Um, and, and we, uh, there were some challenges, you know, not just for us, but other companies that went and did that as well. But work from home introduced a whole new level of security where you had to be on the lookout for to certain areas, not only just with personal networks, like home networks, but people are using but also the adoption of like having a virtual private network as well as there are, as users are on the go and implementing things like uh, that cybersecurity awareness training and span filter that I'm talking about. So work from home was one of the first challenges and it's an ongoing one as businesses are continuing to work from home. Uh, weak endpoints leave businesses vulnerable. So um, people that are leaving uh, endpoints either at the office or that are not being turned off or they're not being managed because no one's really using them. Those are, leaving the businesses vulnerable because no one's keeping an eye on them. And through managed IT services, you wouldn't have that problem or you shouldn't have that problem. And lack of employee education and awareness. Because employees are now working from home and um, there may be a disconnect between having that that face-to-face -face interaction and that extra training and that extra educating that you may have with being in front of the employees. So it's it's very important that you have this training that introduces Hey, these are our best practices. This is what we focus on. We we implement this security stack within the organization. We want you to learn the following systems. Here's some extra videos and training. Maybe even this uh, this webinar, these slides, just to say, hey, this is something that you all should be mindful of and be on the lookout for when you're working on any of our systems or softwares or anything else that you do within this company. So let's dive into weekend points. Um, physical devices that connect to a network, any endpoint that connects to a network or any device that connects to a network is an endpoint. So like your device that is connecting to your company SharePoint or has access to a server or is uh, running business applications and systems, that's going to be an endpoint. That endpoint should be managed, monitored, and maintained through a managed services provider. Why do I believe that? Not, I'm a little biased because that's what we are, but 
you want to make sure that someone is looking after your systems, your software security um, for you so that you can stay focused on your mission, your customers, and everything else that you have going on. By not doing so, it's like not having an alarm system for your home. You want to make sure that someone else is looking out for that so that you can stay focused on other things and, and not have to let those things slip through the cracks. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, Deloitte found that the average cost of an endpoint attack is $5 million. Now, that could be these numbers and these things that they come up with, in my opinion, you know, they're kind of coming from the position of like very large companies. So maybe that number might not be as large for a small business, but the point is made that it's pretty impactful. If an endpoint is exploited, you know, the potential can be not just data law, but it could be ransom that had to be paid. It could be customer information. It could be a HIPAA violation. It could be several different things that could potentially you know, impact your business in many different ways. So yes, that number can be up to 5 million, maybe even more. But in reality is, is that just consider the fact that it's going to be a big impact to you and your company. Obviously the consequences of weak endpoints, you know, there's just something that we want to, you know, keep in mind. That's a major challenge and ways to strengthen your endpoints. So work from home, a significant increase in fraudulent emails for work from home employees. We actually saw and um, that these um, email spam or the spam email kind of increased for a lot of work from home staff for the past two years. We saw just an increase of businesses receiving a lot more spam than they normally did. Maybe it's coincidence. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But I can tell you that we did see personally saw an increase with many of our ourselves and customers that we work with and people, businesses that we work with on a regular basis. They went from not receiving that much spam to receiving a lot of spam. And it happened over the course of six months to a year. And it really picked up during the pandemic. So many businesses were relying strictly on the email security that comes free with like Microsoft Office, for instance. And they were saying, yeah, that's enough. You know, it's doing its job, but it's not enough. And they needed robust systems to be put in place so that they can better protect themselves and their company from these external threats that were trying to hit their systems through email. Um, work from home security challenges businesses face. Uh, that one of the ones that I, I think of is again, I go back to that training where businesses set up this work from home environment for users to go and um, you know, access their computer systems, their softwares and everything else that they, they needed to do their job. But unfortunately, they didn't provide that extra training and that guidance to the end user on, on what they should be looking out for and why it's important to um, have 2FA enabled, for instance, and why it, you know, why they should be looking out for, you know, certain emails that come through that may slip their cracks and different systems that they're using so that people are aware of what kind of security they have in place to protect them. I feel like a lot of that training should have been had with users and should be had with these users, especially if it's a work from home environment, because you lose that, that, that connection, that connection can be lost and people may feel disconnected and may not know who to ask about, you know, IT challenges that they face. Lack of awareness. Um, human error is the greatest opportunity for hackers. A lot of the times these security issues that come up are due to human error. People just clicked a link, opened an email, were following instructions. They didn't know that it was a hacker or that it was a um, an email that was going to be a problem for them. So a lot of the times it happens just simply because of human error. And again, that lack of education is uh, or educating your users is a big part of it. And that's why I mentioned employee education and awareness helps to secure sensitive business data. So that's something that... Um, you know, I think personally, by putting just a couple things in place, you can better protect your company now and moving forward. Excuse me. So email security solutions for businesses. In general, you want to go over, we'll go over solutions that integrate with your chosen email provider. Protecting your, your employees and critical business data from advanced email threats. And to prevent data leaks and unauthorized use with communication monitoring software. So we're going to talk about phishing simulations, MFA and SSO, what those are, why they're important, email spam filters, some examples of ones that you should use and you can set up, email encryption, and uh, backups. So email security solutions for businesses. 
um, we'll talk about fishing simulations. So what fishing simulations do is they, they combat the most common cyber attack. Uh, a lot of the times through fishing simulations, the software that we recommend is going to be through Sophos and it's called Fish Threat and we're an authorized partner to not only support it, but provide it and on an ongoing basis. But Fish Threat is a software that you can use and implement that it's designed to set up, configure, and continuously run phishing simulations regularly for your company. For instance, you can set up what would be a spam or email phishing simulation that runs on a bi-weekly or weekly basis, probably want to be a bi-weekly or monthly basis, that will target specific users within your company. And it'll, 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 It'll battle harden, uh, battle harden them. It'll test them. It'll send an email, a phishing email that looks very convincing. I've seen some of these, and some of them are free gift cards. Some of them look they came from someone within the someone within the organization. Some of them look very, I mean, con uh, convincing. And when the end user clicks on that email, if they do so, not only will it send you a report of who clicked it and when they clicked it and what email they clicked on but it'll also mandatory, uh, make it mandatory, uh, mandatory for them to um, be subscribed to a, or watch a five minute video, three to five minute video on the importance of email security, what they clicked on, the mistake they made, and just better educates them. So it kind of tests them if they fail the test, it gives them over a, it sends them over a video to watch, it provides them training and something for them to look out in the future but you also receive that report from the admin side, letting you know who clicked it, why did they receive the training so that you have that for yourself moving forward. I see there's some hands that are being raised and I wanna ask that we keep, uh, we're gonna get to everyone's questions. So just please drop your questions in the Q and A and we'll do a Q and A at the very end of the presentation. So if this is something you're interested in, please write this down, your question, and we'll get to your question or type it up and we'll get to your question here at the end of the presentation. Uh, Southwest Fish, uh, Fish Threat, again, it provides that education, the awareness, and the security training for end users. It's There's several different solutions out there. You don't have to buy this from us, but my recommendation is to have a cybersecurity awareness training. Um, another good one is Know Before, which is also out there for businesses. Um, the pricing is a little bit different, but personally, going with either option, depending on what you're looking for, would be a good option to have. And what it's going to provide, too, is just tips for spotting phishing emails. I mean, you can you can we've uh, created a lot of content on phishing you can subscribe to our blog and check that out at perry.com forward slash blog um, you can look at us on on youtube we have a lot of videos in this as well we have a lot of free downloadable resources that kind of help and train your users on how to spot these phishing emails but that's what everything that's going to cover through phishing simulations and that the key takeaway here is implementing a cybersecurity awareness training software like fish threat or know before MFA and SSO, multi-factor authentication. Um, so what we're going to go over here uh, and single sign-on. Single sign the multi-factor authentication, MFA, is a verification method that prevents unauthorized party access. And this is a very long way of saying, I'm sure everyone here is in, in work with MFA. It is a way to where you can have a two-factor authentication. So like, let's say, for instance, you have an email account. Well, if you have an email account with a username and password, great. You, you've got the first step of security. You have a decent password. It's long. It's uh, complicated. It's not easy to guess. It's, 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 it's enough. Um, on top of that is going to be an extra layer, which is going to be uh, multi-factor authentication. There'll be something like, hey, once you've logged in, it'll send a text message to your registered phone. So that MFA, that, that 2FA will send you over a text message to your phone. It'll give you a specific code. You'll then type that code in and then it logs you in. So it kind of links your account to your registered device and it's that extra layer of security. Another good example of, of that's 2FA, a good example of MFA will be something like when you set up a QR code reader, for instance, where you'll download something like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator. It'll show you a QR code. You have to register that QR code with the email, um, sorry, with the authenticator software running on your phone, and it'll constantly and continually be cycling through these, let's say, six digits, uh, these uh, numbers. And when you log in to your email account, it'll ask for your um, authenticator uh, number. And that's when you'll get the authenticator number from your device 
and you'll type it in and it'll authenticate and then go on to um, signing you into your uh, email. So I personally like MFA, it's a lot easier. Um, I have go I use Google Authenticator. It's something that's downloadable, it's, it's free and you can most popular softwares and now uh, support it. And if you don't know how to set it up, I'm sure we have a blog written about it. And if we don't, we probably soon will, uh, soon after this will. will. So uh, make sure to subscribe or if you're welcome to ask a question here and I'm happy to help. Now, single sign-on um, enables users to log in with one set of credentials. I also like single sign-on depending on the organization and uh, the workflow and how people use their softwares and what softwares they have in place. Single sign-on is great, for instance, if you utilize something like Microsoft uh, 365, like Microsoft Business Premium, for instance, because then if you use Microsoft Business Premium and then you use something like uh, Zoho, and through Zoho, you can set up a single sign-on to where instead of having an account with Microsoft 365 and Zoho, you could use the exact same account from Microsoft 365 to authenticate into Zoho so that you can log into both systems using the same, uh, uh, using the same account. So it works to where you can have one master account that's protected with MFA, and then you can use single sign-on to then access any of those additional accounts that support single sign-on with Microsoft. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's actually a, a great way to secure your systems and softwares. And if you don't use SSO, or if you don't even have MFA or 2FA, my recommendation and the biggest key takeaway from this should be that you go and implement those things ASAP. Email security solutions for businesses. So we're gonna talk about email spam filters. What do they do? Spam filters detect unsolicited and virus infested emails to protect your users and give you peace of mind. Uh, we'll go over a deep dive audit of email security best practices and hardening Microsoft 365 and G Suite emails with seamless integration. So a lot of these spam filters are gonna do that for you. Um, we're gonna talk about email spam filters, but I, I'll dive a little bit uh, deeper here uh, about my favorite, which is gonna be through Sophos. Um, Sophos has a email spam filter uh, in place called Sophos Central Email. And what it's designed to do is it's designed to have this administration dashboard where you can manage all the incoming and outgoing messages within your organization for all of your users. You can set up a spam policy and have a spam policy in place to where it better protects your email and it scans your emails that are coming in to make sure that they meet the, the expectations or the criteria that you've set. It blocks any spam that's coming within the company so that it immediately quarantine, quarantines that spam and it uh, enables the user to go into their spam filter and check to see what was actually spam and what wasn't, what isn't, so they can either release or deny that email. It just gives you better protection to, to protect, and it acts as a filter so that not everything's coming through and some things are, act, or hopefully spam is being left behind and it's allowing you to have that extra level of security and protection in place. Email encryption, so masks, uh, email content so only intended recipients can access the message. So for essential email, again, also has an email encryption in place with it, and it detects compromised mailboxes and removes spam. It encrypts sensitive data automatically and transparently. So it makes it easy for those for that email to be encrypted so that it's only getting into the right eyes and it's not making it elsewhere or uh, out, um, to someone that's not supposed to be reading it. So email security solutions, um, one of the another thing that you should have that we recommend is obviously good backup in place. So um, having a good backup in place, the, the safety nets for human error, software failure, cyber, cyber attacks, and more. So let's say, for instance, if you don't have a backup and your email is compromised, now all that information, all those emails are now lost. Whether you had email in your inbox, we all do. We all have, um, if you're like me, you have 60, 70 gigs of email sitting in your, you know, the historically, uh, or you archive it, which is the best practice, um, sitting in your inbox or, or any subsidiary folders, uh, or you have it sitting in your sent, uh, sent outgoing email as well. Um, but when you, if you're attacked and if something happens or your email is compromised, now that's lost unless you have a backup in place. Now, my recommendation for a good backup software 
would be Kaseya's Spanning Cloud Services Backup. The software is called Spanning. Yes, we are also partners with them. No, you don't have to buy it directly from us. We just like and trust the software. We use it on a regular basis. Uh, we use it both internally and we provide it to our customers, the ones that subscribe to it. And what Spanning does is it's an easy way to integrate directly into Microsoft 365 or Google Suite. I'm assuming as a business, you're using one or the other. And it makes it to where it creates a backup of all those emails so that they're accessible if you ever need to. If your email is ever compromised and um, whatever happened to your email is now locked down, it provides you a portal to still be able to access your email, send and receive email as you normally would. It provides you access to all of your emails so that they're backed up. You don't have to worry about, is my email now lost? If someone somehow gained access into your Microsoft 365 and wiped that, Kaseya uh, uh, software spanning will still have that data backed up for you so that you can still recover and put something in place in the future so that you're better protected against it. But it ensures business continuity. It does reach industry compliance standards. That's the, if you have any specific compliance standards, you can go to their website and see what they do. And it saves mon money by preventing loss, deletion, or corruption of data. And for the price of spanning, in my opinion, it, and, and for how easy it is to implement, every business should have it. In fact, I mean, every business nowadays should have a good spam filter like Sophos. Uh, central email, um, you know, good cybersecurity awareness training like uh, Sophos Fish Threat, and and um, a, a good solution like Spanning to back up your email so that it protects you now and in the future in the event that you ever need it. But these are very cost, uh, they're not very costly solutions. They're easy to implement and they're also easy, easy to manage, monitor, and maintain moving forward. So if you don't have one of the three or all three of them, my recommendation is to, to pick them up afterwards. The top advantages of email security. Um, a robust email security strategy offers multiple benefits. We know that email security implementation allows each employee to make a positive impact. We're looking at three things here, protecting data, reaching compliance standards, and reducing uh, IT spending. With those three things, that's gonna be just, just be huge for your company not having to focus on, are we gonna get hit through email? Are we putting in the right systems and softwares in place? Do we? Are, are we implementing best practices just by doing the simple things that we were talking about in this uh, webinar, you can protect your business now and in the future, and you can protect your data, reach compliance standards, and reduce your IT spend. So if you're protecting your data, it's going to obviously secure business data and client information. It's going to offer anti-malware and spam protection. It defends against unauthorized access, loss, and compromise. And um, obviously there's a lot more, but if you've been impacted by some kind of malware in the past or an email slipping through the cracks or you know something happened, you know how costly it can be to have your data compromised, whether it is held for ransom or it is lost or stolen or something. I mean, it's something that businesses of all sizes, but specifically small businesses, should be mindful of and always, you know, uh, always consider the fact that, hey, if I'm a small business, I'm probably a target. And if I'm a target, I want to make sure I'm putting the right systems and, and soft uh, systems in place so that we're closing some of these gaps in our security and we're better protecting ourselves, our customers and the people that do business with us um, from these cybersecurity threats. Uh, maintaining compliance. Compliance laws. They, they govern, and, uh, govern the protection and preservation of customer and enterprise data. Depending on your industry, depending on your business, you're gonna have compliance laws. You wanna know what those compliance laws are and you wanna make sure that you're meeting or exceeding those expectations. A lot of the times they're gonna require you to have these email security and these things in place. So once you find out what those are and they're different for every industry, you wanna meet with an IT provider or an IT partner to go over those gaps in security and support and, and close some of them with some of these solutions that I'm talking about. Uh, you want to reach IT laws and standards to preserve your business, minimize the risk of data breaches, and gain trust from clients and employees. That all comes with maintaining compliance. The most important is reducing IT spending. A lot of 
what happens that we don't quite consider from the very beginning is like the ripple effect of what happens when we don't put, let's say, for instance, a good spam filter in place. Let's say, for instance, you didn't want to spend the, I don't know, $6 per user per month, which is a drop in the bucket considering the, the massive cost that comes with, you know, your, your systems being compromised through uh, an email that's slipped uh, through and bypassed your, you know, any weak security. But, you know, let's say it's $6 per user per month. You know, that's a drop in the bucket considering what it costs when somebody accidentally clicks that link in an email that was, um, that, that, that did come through and slip through whatever weak security you have and introduces malware to the network. You know, that's downtime, that's liability, that's possible, you know, uh, legal issues. I mean, there's so much that comes with that. And so much, I mean, downtime, you can calculate this however you want, but that's you're, you know, unable to produce. Um, I mean, everything we do as in computers and technology now. So if you're not able to um, work, your systems are locked down, you're not able to support your customers or work on your projects or anything else, downtime can be hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands, or even more, depending on how long you're down, all because you wanted to avoid the upfront cost of $6 per user per month, which to me is, is something that every business should consider, especially once now that you know what it generally costs it's something that every business should consider and implement for their company. And again, I don't, I'm not twisting arms to buy it from me. I'm saying you should just have this system in place and you should go out and buy it and look into it more. And if you want to talk about it, we're happy to. Please ask your questions in the Q&A. Uh, Gardner and IBM reported that the average cost per email attack is 5,000. Again, I don't know where they get that number from. I'm sure they have some kind of calculation from it or, or uh, some kind of information and data that, that supports that. But let's just say, the point here is made, it costs a lot. That um, anytime email is compromised or an email is compromised, it costs, it can cost about $5,000. To me, you know, that's probably on the short, uh, on the low end. It could cost a lot more depending on the impact that spam email or malware has on the network. Let's say someone clicked on something that locked down all the data and you're not able to access it. And now you have to pay a ransom. Let's say the ransom is one Bitcoin of whatever the price is today, 20,000 or something. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money you're going to have to pay just to get access to your data, assuming that they haven't, um, assuming that they give you access now and don't request the ransom from you a year from now because they still have access to your systems. So all things you got to take into consideration when, when, when you're uh, evaluating your IT security for your company. Uh, reducing uh, IT spending also has uh, maintains employee productivity and efficiency levels. So if your employees are you know, educated on cybersecurity best practices, they have a good security systems in place to, to kind of you know, prevent them from downtime, they're going to be obviously more productive and more efficient. And if they're more productive and more efficient, obviously they're going to be producing more and doing more for the organization. And lastly, it's going to protect the organization's reputation. You don't want to be that company where your business was exploited, your information was leaked, you you know, you didn't put different, you didn't put the basic things in place to protect your company, your employees, your customers, or anything else. I think if you just did the basics, the things that we're talking about today, that goes a long way with better protecting your company, because you'd be surprised with how many people don't actually put these things in place. And they are just kind of taking that risk, knowingly taking that risk when they shouldn't be. So protecting your business with email security, you're going to gain peace of mind with trusted security platforms. You rely on a award-winning responsive IT partner. That's the key there. You want to find a good partner, uh, IT partner that, that works well with your company and kind of has the right solutions in place to protect you. And the transition quickly so you can get back to work. What I think is best is if you're a small business now, and you're kind of thinking about IT security, you have employees, you've got things going on, you're very busy, you're focused on, on growing your company. IT is probably not at the forefront of your mind, or especially security. This is not something you specialize in. In my opinion, it is best if you outsource components of your company, like your accounting, your legal, your marketing, you should be outsourcing the component of IT. And the way you'll do that is you'll find and partner with an IT services provider Someone that is preferably probably in your area or someone that you, you feel has the right solutions to, to protect your company and just ask them, say, hey, 
I want you to perform an audit of my systems and security and tell me about the gaps in, uh, gaps in security and support that I have and how we can fill those gaps with different solutions and to put those solutions in place. And lastly, what it's gonna cost for you to not just implement, but to monitor, manage, and maintain them moving forward so that I can stay focused on my business, my customers, my projects, and everything else that I have going on and not worry about IT slowing me down. If you do that, I feel like a lot of companies will feel a lot better and just have that peace of mind knowing that they don't have to stay focused on that part of it. We don't have to be you know, learning about this kind of stuff in a webinar or anything else. We can kind of entrust that to, to a partner that can take care of it for us, similarly to how we do this with accounting and legal and marketing. So here's our contact information. Uh, get in touch if you'd like. Information will be in the slides there. And I want to thank everyone for your time, your attention, your patience through this. I, I'm assuming everyone's going to have some questions or we have some questions now. So let's take a look at the Q&A. We can kind of go from there. So, um, Bill, I think we just have these two questions. Correct me if I'm wrong, but let's see. We have a question from Larissa. Can you get a virus if you open a phishing email but don't click on any links in it? I find that my email opens up the next email in line instead of letting me choose which one I want to open. Laura, so it's a very specific um, question. And it's unique to your use case. So questions I would have are like, you know, what systems you're using, if you're using Mac or if you're using PC, you know, what's your email, who your email provider is, what software you use to, to access your email, if it's like Microsoft Outlook, for instance. But I'm going to make a couple assumptions here. And I'm going to say, if a phishing email makes it to your inbox and doesn't get categorized as spam, so long as you don't click on a link, you should be okay. And the keyword here is you should be okay. Why? Because there was no action taken on that email. The best thing to do at that point would be to, depending on your email provider, would be to select the email, don't open it, and mark it as spam. You can either block the sender or mark it as spam. But in my opinion, Larissa, you should have a spam filter in place, something more robust like Sophos. It's something that's gonna better protect you where you can set up that security policies and have those in place. But you can also, it learns you, as it learns your email practices, it learns the emails that you send and receive. And if it's doing that, it's going to better protect you, not just now, but continuing to learn and better protect you in the future. Uh, let's see here. We have another question. Bill, do you need me to click these answer live or type answers or? Uh, no, you can just go ahead and answer live. I'll go ahead and do the clicking. Okay. You would like to answer this question live. I've already answered it. Okay, perfect. All right. The next question is, um, let's see, from uh, whereas accessing... My email and Gmail works perfectly fine at home in the public library. I'm not sure. Do, do people see these email, uh, these questions, Bill, or do you want me to read them out loud? Um, I do not think they see them. I think we'll have to. Okay, this is a long one, so I'm going to do my best to. Yeah. This is a long one, so I'm going to do my best to, to answer this one. But we have accessing my own Gmail works perfectly fine at home at the public library. However, Gmail doesn't allow me to go past the Gmail login at the public library as it used to allow before the pandemic. Seems like a security feature. Each time I go home, I answer the Gmail security prompts that I attempt to log into the public library. But when I go to the library again, Gmail prompts the forgot password option when remembering passwords isn't even the issue. This happened several times already to where I don't want to use a library computer to do simple email tasks anymore. What do you think is going on? So my question here is, I don't know based off the question of whether you're using your laptop at the library or if you're using a public computer at the library that is not yours. If it's a public computer at the library, you do not want to be accessing your email in a public computer because that is not a device that is a secure device. So if it's a public computer, you don't want it to allow you. And I'm guessing they have security in place to protect you from accessing that. Um, if it's your computer, you're probably accessing your email from their wireless network. And they may have a policy in place that does not allow that as well. So that's something you may want to talk to somebody at the library or the librarian and say, hey, I'm experiencing this issue. Is this just part of a security policy that you have? Or is this unique to me? And if it's unique to me, 
then um, maybe we can further troubleshoot and figure out what's going on. I hope that answers your question. Our next question we have is, what are the top five things we should know if we buy a domain name and web host today for the first time to cover bases of safety well? Was thinking of getting a Green Geeks registrar and hosting your web host, but not sure if their protocols are up there and preventing facts. So we're talking about a couple different things here. You're talking about um, web and website security, our hosting security, and you're talking about email security. They kind of fall under the same umbrella, but they're two different things. From my experience, from what it sounds like, I would have no, uh, I have a lot of experience working with GoDaddy. Yes, they're more expensive, but the reason why I recommend GoDaddy is GoDaddy is they have 24 seven US based support, which is huge. I like that. Why? Because as a business owner in the very beginning, 14 years ago, I was setting up, configuring, you know, uh, creating my website, designing, developing. A lot of the times I did that after hours and because of it, I liked having that 24 seven support available to me. So personally, I like and have a lot of uh, experience working with the security with GoDaddy. So I personally would look to purchasing my host, my domain and my host with the same organization. And that organization would be GoDaddy. And I would prefer Linux hosting because with Linux hosting, it's more secure. And then I would use something like WordPress, which is a content management system, which I can further lock down as well through MFA and, and have these different security uh, uh, in place. If this is something more you'd like to talk about, you can ask more questions or you're welcome to reach out and we're happy to discuss on the things and steps that we would take in order to help protect that. But to answer your question, um, I, that, that's the way I would do it. I hope that helped. Is it safe to connect to one's computer to a retail business public Wi-Fi if a few seconds to 40 seconds after connecting to NordVPN? So... I like that you mentioned Nord. I'm a fan of Nord. I also like strong VPN. Uh, they're both great VPN. So the way it would work is you would, the way I like to do it, because I also work from public areas as well, and I use a VPN, I use strong VPN, is I don't have anything open on my laptop. So when I open up my laptop, I make sure my email is closed. I make sure all my applications are closed and I use a Mac. Then I connect to their wireless network. After I connect to their wireless network, I then turn on my strong VPN, or in this case, NordVPN. Once I turn on NordVPN and I know it's connected and I know it's securing the connection between my computer, the network, uh, my computer, the network, and the internet and back, that's when I then open up my email and access all the things that I need to access. And that should be the steps that you take before if you're using a, a public Wi Fi and if you're using um, something like NordVPN as well. Right. Um, I think I might have missed one. I see one from, let me just make sure. Uh, dismissed was one. Uh, the one that was, is it safe to connect to one's computer? I'm going to reopen that one, Bill. Uh, it's okay. showing up as dismissed. And uh, we did answer that. So I answered it live and it's done. We have another one here. Give me one second. Mark Jones, I'm going to reopen Mark. Open. We host our company domain with GoDaddy, which is where our email is hosted. How can I encrypt emails? So, um, Mark, depending on GoDaddy, if you're using GoDaddy's email, I believe they're migrating everything or have migrated everything to Microsoft 365. I believe they also sell Microsoft 365. So your email should be utilizing Microsoft 365's encryption and security protocols. What I would do is I would, after this webinar, pick up the phone, call GoDaddy and say, hey, I just watched a webinar on email security best practices. I want to know, A, what, is the, what email am I using for you? Am I using GoDaddy's email or am I using Microsoft 365 or a flavor of that? And B, what security do you all have in place that comes with that? Are my emails encrypted? Does it come with a free spam filter? And just ask those questions, open up that dialogue and see what they tell you. And you can come back to us or you're welcome to reach back out. We're happy to assist and guide you in what direction to take from there. Um, it also gives you an opportunity, Mark, to try out their support. If you haven't already, they have wonderful support and they don't pay me to say that. I just have, a, I've had a very good experience for over a decade now of working with GoDaddy and um, their Arizona-based support is great. And I think you'll like using it as well. Molly is asking, what is your recommendation for the best host for emails? We currently are using HostGator and have 
have a few issues, but we'll be securing our computers with your suggestion in hopes that that may help. So Molly, it all depends. And this is kind of like, this is an opinion, right? Um, my opinion would be Microsoft and specifically Microsoft 365. And if you're a business, you should look at Microsoft 365 Business Premium. Go to Google, type in Microsoft Business Premium. It'll show you the plan. And Microsoft Business Premium is about $22 per user per month. You're going to get a good solid email. You'll have um, good storage and you'll have good security that comes with that. And you'll have a system in place that sets your business up from the start with good security, but also makes it easier to scale in the future as you continue to add employees and implement solutions like Sophos uh, Central Email. So my personal opinion would be Microsoft 365. Another option would be Google uh, G Suite, and you can look up G Suite Business Email, but I would not buy it directly from my host. They're hosting providers for emails and, I'm oh, sorry, for domains and websites. They do not specialize in email and you probably should buy an email uh, provider from an email, I'm sorry, email hosting from an email provider, which is Microsoft 365. So why don't you want to access Gmail at the public library? It's, it's a personal opinion. Um, it's whatever your comfort level is. We all gave risk differently. And it's just to me, my personal email or my business email, I'm not gonna access it on a public device. So if it's a public computer sitting on a public device, I am entrusting that that device is kept secure, that it, it's, it's uh, implemented the best uh, security best practices, and then it's mon managed, monitor, maintained on a regular basis. I don't know that, and those are too many assumptions and too much information for me to find out. I don't mind using a public Wi-Fi if I'm using a VPN, but I will not be accessing my bank account information my email or anything else on a public computer. It's just my comfort level and I don't feel comfortable with it. But if you feel free to do so and you're happy to do so and you're, you're confident in doing it, I would say it's just a risk that you're willing to take that I wouldn't. So another question here is I should at the retail business is password protected as is the Airbnbs I stay at. Do we have to worry about other virus infected computers infecting computers if we access those password protected networks? Um, you know, if you're doing the right things from an endpoint level, not necessarily. So if you have a good malware protection, a good virus protection on your system, like WebRoot, for instance, you shouldn't have a problem though I don't understand there's so many different types of networks and there's different connections. And for me personally, having good endpoint protection is the start. Secondly, if you're accessing those networks, you probably want to use a VPN like NordVPN or StrongVPN just to help protect the data or help protect the information that's flowing through it. But I feel like doing those two things are going to be huge in protecting yourself and protecting, protecting you know, any information that you have on your system. I am the same way. I also like to travel and I, I access uh, uh, wireless act, wireless networks. The most secure thing to do though, if you're you know accessing a network from like a coffee shop or an Airbnb would be to do like a hotspot on your phone or to purchase a hotspot with your wireless provider so that you know that's a secure connection. It's yours and only you have the password to it. And that's what, 50 bucks a month. So you never have to worry about that problem again. I think personally, if your business relies and depends on a secure network, I would, I would make the expense and just kind of go that route because that's going to be the most secure and the one you're going to trust. Gary wants to know, which Linux distribution uh, do you recommend? Uh, you know, it's all about, in my opinion, what's most user-friendly, depending, so you don't have to have too much training behind it. Uh, I like Ubuntu. Ubuntu is very well supported. It also has a good um uh, a good network of users and contributors and you know a, a good community as well built around it ubuntu is something that's kept up to date i believe they updated uh you know they have a new flavor just about every year so i personally if i was setting up a distribution for myself to use or for my team to use and i felt confident and comfortable in training people on how to use the linux distribution because it's very many people are unfamiliar with it i would choose ubuntu What was the importance of having domain registrar and website hosts from the same provider? Would it not be better to keep our eggs in a different baskets? And is Hostinger up there among the best and safest? 
So to, to kind of break down your question, I am not very familiar with Hostinger. I've, um, but that's not to say they're not a good provider. I, I have worked with, uh, for over a decade, for 14 years, many, many different hosting um, providers out there. And this is the first time I've heard about Hostinger. But again, there's so many out there. It would be hard for me to memorize and work with all of them. Um, that just, I just maybe they are good. Maybe they're not. I have no clue. And that's something you can perform some uh, in, you know, research online to see what some other people are reporting back. I like to have my domain registrar and my hosting provider with the same. Now, it's just, it's with the same provider. And the reason being, it's just, it's easier for me to support. From a support perspective, if I'm monitoring, monitor, if I'm uh, accessing it through one portal, it's one throat to choke, one individual that I have to focus on, one company that I have to focus on um, in order for me to troubleshoot and resolve these issues. You know, it's, it's, it's something that it just makes it easier for me. So personally, I would just go that route. If you want to have your domain registrar with somebody else and your hosting provider with someone else, just keep in mind, you're going to have to point those over to and connect them. But I don't think you're really putting yourself at much risk. Um, if you're having them with the same provider, it just makes sense and from a support perspective, but it's entirely up to you. The rest is asking, does a VPN just give you a different location code or does a VPN encrypt all your internet activity? So Larissa, I would, I, I'd advise you to go and check out Strong VPN. You can go to strongvpn.com or nordvpn.com. I believe those are their websites or Google them and you can find their the correct uh, URL and just kind of see what you're getting. Strong VPN costs about $90 a year or, or less. It's roughly between 70 and 90, depending on when you buy it and if there's a coupon for it. But it's going to encrypt all the information from your computer to the internet and back. So what that means is it just it's a secure channel and a secure uh, network from uh, that you're accessing and no one else has access to. So that's essentially what it's going to do. It, you can also use it to put your computer in a different network location. So let's say you're in Texas and you're in Austin. And you said, hey, you know what? I want to pull up um, uh, search results in uh, Manhattan, New York. Well, you can launch strong VPN. You can select a VPN network in, uh, let's say, New York, and you can put your location to be Manhattan. And then you can go to Google and type in best restaurants. And just by doing that, it'll detect your location as being in Manhattan, and then you'd be able to pull you know, information specific to that location. There's different uses for it. There's the use of from a security perspective, which is the encryption of the internet activity. But there's also the marketing use for it of having the ability to put your computer um, location in different locations throughout the world, which you know can, can benefit marketing, can benefit sales. You can have different uses for it, but I hope that helps. Take a sip of my water here before we continue. So your thought on Let's Encrypt SSL versus $99 and the more expensive ones. If you have someone to, if you feel confident and comfortable in, in being able to implement a solution like that, all power to you, go for it. I feel like it's uh, whatever things you can put in place to better protect you are going to be the best options. Um, sometimes it's going to require, you know, if you don't feel confident or comfortable in, in, in implementing uh, a more robust solution, you're going to have to partner with an IT partner in order for something like that to get put in place versus something like a $99 solution that is, you know, download, set and forget, plug in, ready to go. So again, it all just depends on your use case, your business and, and your budget. So I hope that helps. So Michael, I keep hearing ESET at the top endpoint protection. What is special about them and their offerings? So we used to use ESET um, internally and we used to actually be a partner with them too. They're not a bad solution. Uh, they also consistently get ranked very well. Um, I also hear a lot about them and I see them. They're great for the um, necessarily not, not enterprise level, but more like the consumer level. So if you're looking for a good consumer level antivirus uh, software, ESET's not bad. It's something you can put in place. You can download, install it, and it'll run and kind of just have a, a, a full security suite ready ready to go out the, you know, out the gate. Um, personally, though, if you're like a business and you have uh, multiple employees, you're going to want a management dashboard around that. You're going to want someone to manage, monitor, and maintain it for you, which is why I prefer something like Sophos. 
I keep saying Sophos do not because we're just, but we're also partnering with them, but it's actually a really good solution. Um, we're also partnering with uh, WebRoot, which is another great solution. But personally, with uh, Sophos, the software itself is just, it's not just very robust, but it's also an easy management solution. It gives me that 30,000 foot view. It has the whole, you know, just suite behind it and makes it easy for me to manage not just the antivirus for myself, but also for my staff and team members as well. So it all depends on your use case. And if that's something you have more questions on, like, hey, this is my business, this is what we do, and this is how many users I have, you're always welcome to reach out and we're happy to help however we can to kind of guide you in the right direction. Again, you don't have to buy this from us. We'll give you our opinion on what we think would be the best solution for you and kind of go from there. Another question we have is, um, is your personal phone or does your personal phone come with a default personal hotspot password? Can you change that password or will that mess things up? You can change that password to whatever you want. On an iPhone, for instance, you can go to the hotspot functionality and I advise that you should change that password, not make, because sometimes they make it too difficult, but you want to make it, you know, um, change it to something you're a little bit more familiar with that you don't give out to anybody else. Or if you do give it to somebody else, you can always go back in there and change it later so that they don't continuously connect to your hotspot. But to answer your question, it doesn't break anything to change the password. It's easy to change that password. And it all depends on the type of phone that you have. On iPhones, you would just go into settings and go to hotspot. On Android, I would just swipe down, go into the search and type in hotspot and that should get you where you need to be. Update the password and you should be set from there. Another person says a tad confused with Let's Encrypt not be a download set and forget. Like you said, what is the work involved in pursuing a free open source solution like theirs? You know, it's, it's something where you feel most comfortable using and what's better supported. It's really about opinion. And, and you know, whether you want to buy a solution that's $100 a year or use an open source solution, it's entirely up to you. In my opinion, when I look at both, they're both great because I see an individual that says, hey, I wanna, I'm thinking about security and I want to put better security in place. Now, I don't know the history behind Let's Encrypt or let's say a different solution that's paid because I don't know how well they're supported. I don't know what kind of community they have. I don't know what the experience is. I don't know what the, the dashboard, if it's friendly to use, that's all gonna be entirely up to you and what you find most comfortable using because ultimately that your opinion is gonna matter the most. To me, from a cybersecurity uh, professional, I would say putting a solution in place is the first step because a lot of the times when I work with businesses, they don't have these things in place. They they aren't familiar with it. They haven't made that they haven't made that that uh, that, that journey yet, and they haven't in, uh, invested in their companies from this perspective. So personally, I would evaluate both if I were you. Kind of look at the dashboard. What's easy to set and forget? What's easy to implement? What's it going to cost? What's the support like? If I run into a problem, can I get a hold of somebody? Or am I going to have to be searching through you know thousands or hundreds of forums to get my answer? Or can I pick up the phone and call someone? Those are two different things that you have to, those are many things you have to consider when looking for a solution that makes the most sense for your company and your business. Um, another question I have here is, what do you need to set up VPN and use it? So a VPN, virtual private network, it all depends on a couple things and what you need. If you're saying, I, what do I need to set up a VPN for my company? Like I have a business network, we wanna set up a VPN, that would require hardware and a software appliance and you would have to go and buy something uh, like, a, like a sonic wall, for instance. Um, that would have to be configured, set up, or that would have to be set up, configured and employed by an IT professional or someone that is uh, confident and comfortable in working in those systems. If that is not your use case, if you're talking about as an individual, what do I need to set up a VPN as an individual and use a VPN? That's a solution like NordVPN or StrongVPN, which is my favorite. You would go to strongvpn.com. You would pay the, I think it's $80 a year. I'm not sure what the price is, $70 to $100, $80 a year. You would download the software. You would log in with your credentials and then you're done. Simple. You would now have a VPN that you can secure connection on whatever network that you use to access your data and, and, and or access the internet, send emails, do whatever you got to do. So, and for $80 a month, I think, I mean, I'm sorry, $80 a year at the drop in the bucket now that you can use all these free and available public Wi-Fi's confidently knowing that your, that your information is kept secure. 
Apple senior advisors have said my iPhone, which was wonky, cannot be hacked. Is there truth to this from what you know? If they did the troubleshooting and things look clear, should we consider adding Bitdefender iOS or related app on our phone to look deeply for something, any better alternative to theirs? So this is where it kind of gets gray. Um, I don't want to say, so in my opinion, Apple does have great security. iPhone does have great security. But I mean, a Google search can find, can, can, can give you some results on how good their security is. For instance, I would probably Google, has iCloud ever been hacked before? And you may find articles from several years ago stating that people's iCloud accounts were hacked. How they were hacked is unique to those users and individuals in those cases. But to me, for someone to just say it can't and won't ever be hacked is just, that's silly. Because it's possible. Now, how likely and probable it is, I have no idea, depending on the type of security that you have. But that's just one person's opinion. I would kind of approach this as a skeptic and say, well, if it can be hacked, it might be hacked. And if it might be hacked, it might doing the things and putting the systems in place to, to better protect me. Bitdefender iOS is, excuse me, one solution. I also know Malware iOS, uh, Malware Bytes has an uh, iOS software as well. Um, I would look at the different softwares out there and, and figure out what you're trying to protect on your iPhone and kind of go from there. If you're trying to protect iCloud, you know, maybe look at iCloud specific security solutions. If you're uh, trying to protect your, um, your phone from accessing a public Wi-Fi, I would look at a VPN solution. If you're in general just looking for an anti-malware solution or something, I'm sure there's, there's something out there that exists for, for uh, Apple iOS. But really hone in and narrow down what you're trying to protect and then look for a solution out there because just Apple saying, don't worry about it. I mean, I would kind of, uh, I, I would kind of think, Maybe if there's something I can put in place, why not do it? It's not going to hurt if it's not going to harm, you know? If it's not going to harm, then why not? Um, another question I have here is, what's a free version for a VPN? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if there's a free version to tell you the truth. I can tell you that they're all pretty fairly inexpensive. Um, there's a lot of different versions, a lot of different VPN providers out there. I've mentioned Nord. I've mentioned, I've mentioned um, uh, StrongVPN. They all range about, I've seen some as cheap as $40 a year up to $100 a year. Find a solution that makes the most sense for you and makes your budget, in my opinion, for something like 40 bucks a year, $50 a year, that's a drop in the bucket for a good VPN solution. A lot of these VPNs too will have like a one or two year sign up coupon or something. So if you're going to go to NordVPN, for instance, uh, before you kind of pull the trigger and buy a solution, maybe go open up another tab and look for NordVPN coupons or strong VPN coupons and see if you could take advantage of something for like a one or two year promotion or something. I mean, that, that's kind of something I would do and it makes the most sense. But I wouldn't specifically trust just a free VPN solution because they got to make money somehow. And either that's going to be through advertising or just a, um, a not a good experience, a very slow experience that may ultimately impact your, um, your using of the software and it may prevent you from using it altogether. What security ex Chrome extensions that I recommend? Uh, you know, I like, uh, if you're thinking about security stuff that implements with, with Chrome, I like Dashlane. Dashlane is a password manager and it's a great way to manage all of your, password, your passwords in one place um, and keep them secure. Dashlane also has a Chrome extension so that it's easy for me instead of having to type and memorize or use the same password for everything like many people do and they're afraid to admit. Um, it actually integrates with my dash, uh, my dash lane and my dash uh, password database, and it'll sync those passwords and allow me to uh, pre-populate those passwords into specific websites that I use. So dash lane's a favorite of mine. Um, I know Malwarebytes also has a good uh, malware, um, uh, anti-malware extension through Chrome as well. So you can look at their uh, solution there. But those are a couple that I come off. Uh, off the top of my head that I think are, are good things that you can put in place now that you can um, that you can start utilizing moving forward. What browser do I use? So I use a Chromium-based browser, Edge. Edge is through Microsoft and it's part of the Microsoft solution stack. So if you're part of Microsoft, like like um, suite of, of, of solution or suite of softwares, Edge is theirs, and it's built off of a Chromium uh, backend, which means it's built off of the same thing that uh, Google Chrome is built off of. So it's, it's, it's fairly secure. 
it's it's very well supported and it works very similarly to Chrome. So if you're familiar with Google Chrome, you'll have no problem switching to Edge. I like Edge because it integrates and syncs with all of my other Microsoft devices. Again, that's very unique to my use case. But if you're also with Microsoft, I definitely recommend Edge. If not Edge, I would also recommend using either Chrome or Firefox. Both of them are great solutions. Or all three of them are great solutions. Hi, Eric. I find using Proton VPN from my phone makes problems when using or uh, causes problems when using Google Voice. How to prevent this? I am so glad you mentioned Proton VPN because I'm a big fan of Proton. My email is personally through uh, my personal email is through Proton Mail. I like Proton Mail quite a bit. Um, they have a whole suite of uh, they're they're really big on security. They have an entire security suite um, of, of one their email, but two their VPN services. So I'm glad you mentioned them. Um, personally, what you're experiencing is if you have Proton VPN running and you're making and taking calls through Google Voice. Chances are is that you're either one making those calls through a cellular connection, which is not as strong as say a um, as like a connection through a wireless network would be, um, or two the uh, your data packets are being dropped because the Proton VPN is just not processing that information that's going back and forth fast enough to have a good experience with Google Voice. So either A, don't use Proton V, don't use your VPN when you're making uh, or taking Google Voice calls, or B, connect to a wireless network, then turn on Proton, Proton VPN, and then make and take those calls so that you have a better connection. And C, if that doesn't work, turn cellular off while using the wireless connection with Proton VPN and Google Voice. I would try those troubleshooting steps and then get back to us. You're always welcome to reach out. We're happy to help. Do IoT devices pose security risks? Um, the Internet of Things, a lot of these IoT devices, absolutely. Um, you know, we've heard a quick Google search can talk about how Ring uh, camera systems have been hacked in the past. Um, Ring doorbell, I know, has also had some had some security issues. I think they've had security issues. Again, go do some research, and I'm sure you can find some, some articles to support that. Um, personally, for me, it's still very new with IoT devices kind of being pushed out right now of what threats they actually pose. But from my perspective, they're a device, if they're connected to your network and they have an, uh, an IP address assigned to them, if you don't protect your network well enough, sure, if that device is, let's say, a camera system is connected uh, uh, to, to your home or your business or something and that camera system is compromised, Absolutely, it is a security threat and poses a security threat, and which is why it's more important, more than anything, if you're implementing IoT devices, to have good security in place, like a good firewall, um, uh, hardening of uh, security appliances, um, hardware devices, uh, software solution, uh, solutions, just putting those best practices in place. And more importantly, meeting with an IT provider to kind of help guide you through the, that, that and performing an audit to make sure that you're closing those gaps in security. Um, looks like we have another question here. Let me take a, a sip, if you don't mind. Related to marking spam emails as spam. I've clicked the Gmail report as spam, which I click the report and unsubscribe button in the pop-up. But then I found it takes me to unknown company's website where it says unsubscribe complete. Does the computer browser being taken to that page pose a security risk? Yes. So. What I would do is rather do not, in any email that you receive, Michael, that comes into your inbox, you don't want to click any links. I don't care if that link says click here to unsubscribe. You don't want to click any links from an email that you don't trust, especially from a sender that you don't trust. And if you've, especially if you've never even subscribed to their newsletter to begin with, you should not click any emails in there because that unsubscribe email, or I'm sorry, that unsubscribe link or that ups, unsubscribe button in their email may send you to the actual threat online, which will then download the malware to your system or could uh, potentially um, just be another way for uh, a cybersecurity threat or risk. So what I would do is A, have a better spam solution in place. Take a look at Sophos. It's, it's a great solution. You're welcome to reach out. We're happy to help. And B, if you're using Google uh, Gmail, 
When the email comes in, simply just mark it as spam and block. Do not click anything or any link within that email. Do not unsubscribe, leave it alone and go from there. The only exception is if let's say, for instance, you received an email from a newsletter that you did subscribe to that you no longer want to receive. You've, you did subscribe to it. You have been consistently receiving their emails every Tuesday, at eight o'clock, they send you an email and you know, hey, you know what? I'm tired of receiving their emails. Then you can go to the unsubscribe in their, in their email, hover over it. If it looks like a legitimate link and it'll go to their website directly to their website, then yes, you can unsubscribe from there but I would not do it from an email that I did not trust. I hope that answers your question. Michael says, right, I don't even click the unsubscribe hyperlink in their email. I find marking spam even with repeatedly marking spam doesn't stop their flow of email. So I really want to unsubscribe if you where I'm coming from. I agree, Michael, 100%. I don't know if there's a block option, but this is why the difference between using a free spam filter and a paid spam filter make a big difference. With a paid spam filter, you can have an allow and block list. You can block domains, you can block IP addresses, you can block specific types of content. You can do a lot. With the free solution provided by Gmail, it's very limited as to what you can do. So if there's a block option within Gmail, block that sender from sending you an email or block that domain. So at company.com, Whatever their domain is, you can block that. But you want to be careful not to block at Gmail because then you would block all Gmail emails coming into your inbox. And that'd be something that'd pose a different problem altogether. I think, Bill, that is all the questions. That was quite a bit of questions. Let's see if there's any more. I'm going to mark these all as done. I hope I got to everyone's questions. I hope you answered everyone, everyone's questions thoroughly. If you have any other questions, please. Let us know. Um, I don't know if you want to hang out, Bill, for another minute or so, see if any other come in, or if you want to wrap up, it's up to you. Unmute. Um, yeah, if you want to raise your hand to ask a question now, uh, we can unmute you. Otherwise, uh, you're free to, uh, to leave or to uh, type in a question right quick before we go. Uh, There's great participation, good questions, good answers. Uh, that was seemed like a very productive workshop this morning. So thank you very much, Eric. And I don't see any hands or any questions. So I think we will call her today. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for your time and attention. I appreciate you. And if you do have any other questions or anything else, just please reach out. Uh, as I mentioned before, SCORE has been a massive help to myself and my company. So please utilize their services. They're, they're great. And um, we're happy to help however we can. So thank you, Bill, for having us. Thank you. Bye.